I'm Eckhart Gall. I'm the head of the School of Mechanical Engineering. It's my uh, pleasure to be here and uh, listen to our exciting uh, associate uh, professors. But it's my distinct pleasure now to introduce uh, one of the associate professors in the School of Mechanical Engineering, uh, James Guibert. Uh, James uh, got his education completely at Clemson, uh, a BS, MS, and PhD degree, the PhD in 2009. Then he stayed as a postdoc uh, in Clemson for a couple of years, and then he started his academic career as an assistant professor at uh, Clarkson University and was there for a couple of years before he came over and joined Purdue in 2015 and then got promoted uh, to associate professor last uh, this uh, summer in August and uh, has uh, done uh, just a, a tremendous work for us. Uh, his research, James' research, uh, uh, ranges from the development of embedded electromechanical sensors that exploits novel sensing techniques at material nonlinearities to the understanding of dynamic interactions caused by continuous forces in nonlinear systems, or by discontinuous forces, I should say. So he applies his theoretical work to packaging and additive manufacturing. Uh, and uh, I'm sure we will learn a lot about uh, the, uh, a few of the other applications. Uh, the impact of his work has been recognized uh, by the community among uh, many other things. Uh, but for example, by multiple invited talks, uh, in particular, I would like to uh, mention the uh, 2018 conference on the theory and application of nonlinear dynamics and the 2019 ASME conference on smart material and adaptive structures and intelligent systems. Also, he has received the best paper awards with his students and the work that I mentioned in his research has been adopted by industry. In particular, I would like to mention uh, his non-linear packaging modeling technique has have aided the development of new design tools for the packaging systems for plotters and is now being applied by Hewlett Packard. Uh, a few other noteworthy items about uh, James. Uh, he is an outstanding research mentor to uh, his graduate students uh, that uh, I conduct exit interviews with all PhD students and uh, uh, they just uh, love to work for him. Uh, and um, uh, what I greatly appreciate as a head too right now in the current environment, he works a lot with our undergraduate students on research, and that is uh, uh, greatly appreciated. Um, another thing that is very close to my heart is uh, global engineering education. Uh, and he has a very strong relationship uh, with the Polytechnic uh, di Tor Torino in Italy. He exchanges researchers, he works with researchers, he has some of them coming over and, uh, and really, uh, I think, helps us to uh, uh, maintain our global presence in this. Um, finally, uh, one of the last points I wanted to make is also, uh, James just uh, does a fantastic job helping, not just on the school level, but in particular on the college level with diversity, equity and inclusion uh, topics, activities, uh, has been on panels, has helped uh, the minority and engineering program. And uh, I think that all makes us uh, a better place. And finally, in all of this, what he has done, he has even written a textbook. He co-authored a textbook with one of our other colleagues in uh, the School of Mechanical Engineering on statics. Thank you. Thank you, Eckert, for that introduction. You're very welcome. I'm just going to talk a little bit about my academic journey. And then I'll focus on some several interesting research projects, but I've had quite a unique journey here to Purdue, and I would like to share that. Before I do that, though, I need to welcome my, uh, to acknowledge my fellow travelers on this journey with me. Uh, That's my wife, my, uh, and my two daughters. Here's my journey. I came from a small town in upstate South Carolina. It's called Star. I'm sure you've all heard of it. It's very, um, as I could mentioned, I received all my degrees at Clemson University. Um, which is ironic, but uh, I didn't intentionally plan to go to Clemson at first. I had a dual interest in history also, 
And so becoming going into science was one choice. Um, so I've received all my uh, degrees in mechanical engineering. And along the way, uh, I didn't even start as an engineer, actually. I started as a computer scientist. The lady that you see here is Sue Lasser. She's in charge of the program. Uh, she brought students in over the summer to actually go take calculus classes. Then she provided mentoring and she provided uh, tutoring services. Okay. Uh, I didn't yeah. go to the calculus classes over the summer, Sue. I'm sorry about that if you're online. Um, I actually went to Hawaii for a wedding, so I enjoyed that. Um, but I did benefit greatly from this program. And that's part of the reason I'm very passionate about giving back to this, these type of programs. I ended up tutoring for uh, in this program for years. And I remember I could have a handful of, I could have a, a room, I could get, have a room full of students that would actually sit down, listen, and I would explain things. And they were like, well, why didn't my professor explain it that way? And that continued on until I actually taught my first class as a PhD student. And I listened to some of the other students explain what I taught. And they say, well, why didn't my professor explain it that way? So I think there's some kind of cognitive disconnect when it's you teaching them as a student versus you teaching them as a professor. And I think that's something that we don't explore often enough. Um, the second individual that you'll see here is my uh, PhD uh, master's advisor and my PhD uh, co-advisor. His name is Eric Austin. Um, I discovered re I had a passion for research as an undergraduate and working in his lab. I actually, some of the things that you see uh, that are present in my research now are due to him, to his influence. My very first research project was embedding sensors in tires, which as you'll see is kind of, uh, we've kind of, I've kind of kept that idea of embedding sensors. Uh, Eric was a great teacher, great mentor, and still is a great friend. I remember taking his class. He taught uh, system dynamics out of Ogata and he basically taught the whole book, which in a semester, which was a lot. And I didn't realize that till afterwards. Uh, my second person that advised me was George Fidel in design optimization. George was a great mentor. He taught me how to manage people very well and then, um, so forth. So my journey, though, kind of takes this weird bifurcation, as I like to call it. Um, at the end of my at the end of my Ph.D., I. Uh, Finished my PhD and I didn't really know what I was going to do. I literally didn't know what I was going to do. I was, uh, I remember at the end, I had spent so much time writing and I had my daughter at that time and I hadn't really started looking seriously for a job. I had some job interviews, uh, but those I didn't really do well because I wasn't prepared as a faculty member. And so the things that uh, I remember, uh, I, um, I remember that I had only one opportunity there. It was to teach in the civil engineering. I called the professor up the night before and he said, yeah, there's a position open and he hired me. And so during that time from uh, teaching as a civil professor, I taught statics, dynamics, fluid dynamics. And during that time, I worked with this gentleman here, Mohammed Dekak, on finishing and extending my PhD research into, a, into an NSF grant. We wrote the first NSF grant, um, and I would like to say it was funded. It was not. <laughs> uh, I remember being absolutely devastated, and he looked at the reviews, and he said, we're going to do one thing. We're just going to rearrange it. We rearranged it, and it was funded. During that time, I also uh, worked on with this gentleman ladder, gentleman, gentleman here, uh, Dr. Joseph, on a postdoc with Michelin looking at the non-pneumatic looking at vibrations of non-pneumatic tires. And then from that point on, I prepared myself to be a faculty member. I uh, went to faculty talks. I studied about what it takes to be a successful faculty member. I basically sought out mentors to help me become a faculty member, something I've wanted to do most of my life. Uh, but before that, I did spend some time. Eric had moved to uh, Moog CSA, which ironically was started by a Clemson graduate. And I spent some time at Moog CSA looking at... Um, basically um, vibration, isolation and satellites, space situational awareness. I then transitioned to an assistant professor in Clarkson and now at Purdue. Way too much time on that. Okay, so um, my academic, my uh, research interest, nonlinear dynamics, smart materials and additive manufacturing. And I look at the, basically the convergence of these. 
Some of the sponsors and collaborators uh, for our research are shown here. Um, and I'm only gonna talk about a couple of our projects. I do some interesting nonlinear work in multimodal systems, but the, um, the things I wanna highlight here was our, my first uh, NSF grant as a lab here. And this is basically looking at developing inexpensive sensors for smart packaging and wearable materials. And so these inexpensive sensors are basically rely on static electricity. And basically you take two dielectrics, come in contact, charge develops on the surface, you vary the voltage and you vary the distance and you get a, a current flowing through. And so what we, a lot of the performance of these systems depend on the initial surface charge distribution and air breakdown. And so we develop very specialized equipment to actually look at the surface uh, charge, some through looking at the Coulomb force, which you see with the probe at the top and others to directly measure um, the charging process, the Coulomb force, and to basically quantify static electricity and to improve the performance of these devices. Not only do we use these devices for, um, to want to improve their performance, but we actually want to utilize these in actually developing smart structures. So a lot of my work has been actually embedding these devices into basic isolation systems for vibration structures. And so here you see some of our work in basic devices embedded in polymer structures. And in real time, you can actually uh, track the deformation corresponding to the voltage. And you can actually, it saturates at a certain point. In addition, it also provides some um, vibration set, uh, some for, uh, vibration absorption characteristics. The other area that we've, uh, where we're going with these self-sensing structures is we're going past the idea of uh, tribal electric sensors just in uh, elastomeric structures. We have uh, working with the army through the uh, a cooperative agreement with Purdue. We're the only uh, group that's looking at actually protecting um, structures instead of actually blowing things up or uh, explosives. And we're looking at embedding them into metal structures using a process known as ultrasonic additive manufacturing. We're not only using this process to embed our tribal electric structures, but we're also using to embed strain gauges and other smart material structures into uh, metal surfaces for our purposes of armor. So here you see my student touching one of these and uh, is sensing his touch. And then to the bottom right, you see the strain gauge in metal, and then you see the strain gauge in uh, over. Okay, uh, other things that we've been doing with the Army is looking at the uh, sensorization of SLA 3D printed composites. And so we've basically developed a technique to basically embed structures in 3D printed SLA ceramic like uh, materials. Um, it's not a true ceramic material, but it does have the same failure mechanisms in this. And the whole idea is to basically study the uh, fracture as your um, as this uh, armor is being penetrated. Other uh, things that we've done in the lab is develop structures for programmable stiffness. Basically, if you have a machine that has resonance frequency changes, can you develop a platform to actually change the stiffness to accommodate for that? And so we take this elastomeric structure and we program in we basically uh, have cavities in, and we can change the stiffness by selectively inserting rigid elements into this. Um, this simple elastomeric structure here, that which has 12 rigid, uh, 12 cavities, can actually represent 72 different stiffness states, and uh, I also 72 different possible natural frequency programming. You can see some of the compression, some of the uh, frequency base. It also has this encapsulated. Uh, buckling that you can uh, monitor, um, that you can actually create structures that have quasi zero stiffness or nearly flat stiffness. And that's useful for dynamic continuation, especially if it's flat, not if it's quasi zero, if you're loading, preloading to that range. Uh, and this idea of embedding the tree programmability, we did this on simple uh, inserts that are horizontal and vertical, but you can also change the shape and change the behavior of this. And so you see some different candidate shapes on the bottom here with different uh, force displacement relationships also. 
Um, and perhaps my most impactful work has been in researching and packaging dynamics. Uh, this has been uh, with a partner at Clemson, Greg Batt, the College of Agricultural Engineering, especially uh, working with the International Safe Transit Association, um, which basically regula regulates packaging, Lansmont, and some testing done in coordination with Eli Lilly. And so here, some of the work that uh, ISTA wanted for um, us is to actually look at the possibility of multi-axis vibration response in packaging, because most typical packages are quantified with um, vertical excitations. So here we're looking at what happens when you have excitations in multiple directions. So for this project, it's probably the most fun I've ever had on a project. We basically outfitted a box truck with sensors and drove it over a controlled track and had a chase car. So you can see some of the vibrations of the truck. And inside, we looked inside the package. We uh, you can see the vibrations of the package. And then we reproduced this at a shaker at Eli Lilly to show that you can qualitatively get the same type of motion testing as you can um, as you can uh, as measure. Other things that we've done with this, uh, we have the same type of facilities here at Herrick Labs. And so we've done some sensor placement studies to actually determine how you best, uh, how you best actually measure this um, vibra uh, vibrations. And we've also done work with uh, shot quantification with HP in which Eckford has mentioned. And since I'm running low on time, I want to skip to some of my teaching and outreach. Uh, basically, I teach mostly basic mechanics courses, mechanical vibrations and introduction to nonlinear systems. I've helped with a uh, lecture book. Uh, I'll edit a lecture book here with my colleagues, uh, Jeff, Car uh, Jeff Rose and Chuck Carlsgirl. Again, I spend a lot of time doing group outreach. Um, some at the Girl STEM Institute at IUPUI, others at the Imagination Station, and I work closely with MEP. This is us at this Promise event that was held recently. Okay, so I would like to acknowledge all my students, both at Clarkson, Clemson, and at Purdue. Uh, my formal mentors, uh, Patricia Davies and Jeff, uh, Jeff Rhodes, my department chair, the Neil, uh, former department chair, Neil Bajaj, and Eckerd Grohl, my current department chair, and uh, teaching mentor, Chuck Crossgrill. But in general, I would like to acknowledge all of the ME department in Purdue. They've been extremely welcoming, extremely helpful, extremely open. Uh, here's the picture of my group and some of the things that we've done together. And thank you. Thank you very much, James. Uh, really nice. Uh, do we have any questions? No questions online yet? But, uh, let me ask you a question, uh, right? So you're, you have tenure now, you can speak freely. Uh, you have three department heads here. And amongst that here, right, we want, want to make you successful. Right? I mean, that was kind of his message, right? We want to do our best to really help you. So here's your chance. What can you tell me what I need to do to uh, help you? That's a loaded question. That I is know. a loaded question. <laughs> but, uh, maybe a, a, a snippet or something that comes to mind, right? Like how uh, the Purdue administration in general can help associate uh, <clears throat> professors uh, to uh, to get to the next level. So I know there are already exist mechanisms for you to retool your research in area uh, in other areas. I think that would be nice to be expanded for more uh, for uh, expanded opportunities. Um, specifically, I'm probably the wrong person to ask this, Eckert, and I will be on. <laughs> That's good. I mean, maybe that, that speaks for what you said at the end. You feel very well supported and uh, very uh, in, a, in an environment where you can grow and, uh, and move forward. Uh, but if there ever is anything, you know, uh, please do let me know. Uh, any other questions? Yes, please. Oh, what's next? Um, 
So I want to focus more on um, some theoretical work in multi-axis vibration and basically looking at that and how it corresponds to natural systems. So, uh, and basically looking at what can we learn from, I mean, not multi-axis, multimodal vibrations. What can we learn from natural systems for, to exchange energy and to create resilient structures? So that is one area that I would like to pursue. Um, the other area that I would like to pursue even more is the idea of the programmable structures. I think we've only, this idea of placing inserts and changing the stiffness is only the beginning. It seems it's very promising. Uh, there's, um, I didn't show some of the preliminary work, but some of the best performance we had were out of materials that were recyclable, like paper instead of plastic. And so now you can start thinking about uh, developing engineering structures that are actually sustainable. And the reason I really feel important about this is because of basically the incidents in Haiti, I mean, in, uh, yes, in Haiti and in Japan but during the tsunami and earthquake. And you can see the damage that was wrought in Haiti versus Japan in just because of money. So if we can develop sustainable, deep, inexpensive, resilient absorption structures, I think is very important. Very good, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, this is Guder Samadhi. I, um, I don't have a question. I just want to congratulate <laughs> uh, James for all the accomplishment. I was amazed and impressed. Thank you very much. Great seeing you. Thank you, Guder. Thank you. All right. I think uh, we may be good then. Uh, the question is, am I closing this out? Where, is, uh, where did Arvin go? You know, like when you need him, you know, so. Okay, uh, so I'd be happy to uh, close us out. Then uh, I want to thank you again for attending today. I want to thank our uh, three speakers today, our three associate professors. Uh, I think we have tremendous talents at Purdue and that comes clearly through. So it's, uh, it's wonderful to hear your stories. And with that, uh, have a great day and goodbye. <laughs>